Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the to the Northeastern Regional Advisory Council meeting for August 4th, 2022. I'm Brett Previdel. I'm the current chair of this group, and I will take a moment to let the group introduce themselves. Dusty, do you want to start on that end? Sure, this is Dusty Carpenter, and I'm with the Vernal Field Office Bureau of Land Management. Natasha Haddon with U.S. Forest Service. Rebecca Jones and I represent non-consumptive users. Go ahead. I already introduced myself. Hey, I'm Miles Hammer, and I'm the Regional Supervisor for the Division of Wildlife Resources. Mike Smith, I represent the non-consumptive wildlife users. Jeff Taniguchi, I'm representing the sportsmen. Robert Johnson, representing the U Indian tribe. Thank you. I'd like to welcome the DWR personnel that are here and appreciate their work that they've done to prepare for this meeting. And those of the public that have came to make comments, we'd like to see you here. So thanks for coming. With that, I'll, I'll move into the agenda and I will ask for an approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second that motion. I think the way we'll do it, Robert, is is we'll we'll go by show of hands here locally, and then um, we'll just ask you for a verbal verbal vote. Everyone in favor? Okay. Any opposed? Robert, you good with that? Yes. Um, now I'd ask for a motion to approve last meeting's minutes, the small book that was that was written. Motion to accept the meeting minutes. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Robert, you good? Yes. Okay. Thank you. With that, um, I will give a brief update of the wildlife board meeting. Um, if you remember the, uh, the, the, mo the meeting we had last was primarily about the landowner association rule modification, but there was some other, some other business on the agenda. Um, there was some some discussion about the the quotas on the on the deer and the motion that was made by the by the wildlife board that that actually passed that was that they allow one either sex tag for fall hunts remove the public land from the fall hunts and set a maximum camp of 25% less than the amount of sold the previous year in each region. Do you have a, do you know exactly what that pertained to? Um, it was, it was the turkey. It was, it was when we, we discussed the either sex turkey tags and they were giving two fall tags and there was a concern that the hunters were targeting just toms and the intent of the turkey um, fall hunt is to reduce the depredation problem and they were not getting a harvest of hens. And so th that's what that centered around and they're trying to get a, a hen harvest on the turkeys where there is a fall hunt. There, there was quite a bit of concern about the air rifles in our meeting and also around the state. Not if we if we make them a legal weapon for turkeys, that there's no um, Pittman Robertson tax that comes in, like like on other firearms and ammunition, and so the state would not, the DWR would not receive any any revenue from that. 
And so the, the motion that the board made was that they, they recommend to the legislature, If let me back up a little, the red legislature directed the board to find opportunities for air, air rifles, I guess you call them, air guns around the state and turkeys was the discussion that it was most relevant for. So the, the motion that was, they recommend to the legislature that they approve the list of hunts as presented and that we recommend that the legislature put forth a relatively significant state tax before this list can be implemented and they, they could be hunted and, and that we want to incentivize through this tax the industry to go to the Pittman Robertson route. But if this but that if this tax is not implemented, there there can be no hunting of air guns. So if they, if they wouldn't go towards the Pittman Roberts and they wanted a a tax on the state in the state to offset that lack of revenue. The rest the remaining turkey recommendations were approved as presented. They also approved the, the Parker Mountain sage grouse hunt as presented. And then there was a discussion on, on the loss of preference points for landowner tags. And that they, they recommended that they, they remove that section and not penalize landowners for getting a landowner tag and so the motion was to remove the section of the rule requiring the loss of preference points from rule 657-43. Then there was a, a long discussion with approximately 100 um, comments from the public related to the Landowner Association. It wasn't quite as long as, as here, but it was, it was an extensive crowd and it was pretty much the same you know, the same discussion that we had here. And there just wasn't any middle ground, uh, primarily between the Diamond, Diamond Mount, Mountain Landowner Association and the, and the DWR regarding the issue of public access in any, in any form. And so there was, there was a lot of debate and a few hours of discussion and so the, the motion that came out of it is that the, the board moved that they approve the landowner permit rule amendments as revised and pre presented to the wildlife board today and allow the division, the LOA committee and the landowner associations to bring back any recommended changes to the August, September RAC board meetings. If no changes are brought forward, then the rule will stand as presented today. Um, there's been some movement a little bit on that since that. Would now be a proper time to kind of update that? Or should we? Okay, so I'm, I'm on the Landowner Association Committee and, and there was some proposals that came in from some of the landowner associations um, there was a lot of concern around the state that they were not informed and they were kind of caught off guard by the, by the rule amendment. There were two landowner association representatives on the committee and the DWR felt they were well represented and we'd kind of assume there was some communication and there wasn't but, and they don't have a formal way to have communication. So some of the rules were to fix that um, lack of lack of information getting spread, um, such as so so some of the suggestions were to create uh, <clears throat> an advisory committee similar to the CWMUs and and that was supported. Um, then there was quite a bit of discussion about weighting the um, private land or irrigated land or what different than the public land, maybe rather than acre per acre to maybe come up with a new formula. And that's a lot more complex. And so that is moving forward and it'll be discussed at the wildlife board, but 
if you if you want me to guess what's going to happen, they'll probably create that advisory committee and then give them some assignments moving forward so that the the issues will get addressed. But um, the the issue of public access was kind of the issue and the wildlife board feels very strongly it's going to be required and the several of the LOAs feel very strongly it's not going to be acceptable. So I'm sure there will be some fallout as whether they want to participate in the program. And then the, the other um, motion that was made, the final motion was the wildlife board moved, they asked the division to look into a youth only dedicated hunter type program for youth ages 12 to 17 that would allow yearly participation with a harvest restriction, two deer in a three year period. And that'll be placed on the action log and, and at least looked into. That's pretty much an update of the wildlife board. It was a, it was a long meeting, well attended, but it was primarily the landowner association issues that took the time. With that, I'll ask Miles to give a, a regional update. All right, thank you. So uh, this summer seems like it's been really quite busy. It's going by really fast. There's been a lot of things going on, so it makes time time fly. Just a quick update uh, to the rack and, and the public as well as uh, we've been working to refill uh, agricultural rep position uh, that was vacated by Dick Bess, um, and uh, also filling a, another public at large position on this rack as well. So we've had some interviews for those. We're still just awaiting the final uh, decision from the DNR director on that, and he's the one with the authority to make those appointments. So it uh, should be in place by our next uh, rack meeting, but I wanted to I let people know that. So this first slide uh, is kind of an update from administrative services um, and it just talks about, it just shows a couple of graphs about our license sales for bull elk this year um, in 2021. And the left graph uh, shows the, the any bull sales in 2021 and then uh, in blue it shows uh, 2021 and then in uh, orange the 2022 any bull sales. And you can see that uh, they sold out pretty quick this year. Um, with some of our technology, we were able to put some of our databases on the cloud, which really made our internet uh, applications run really quite smoothly this year. There were very short uh, waiting room lines, I guess you would say, in the virtual waiting room. And, um, people were able just to get on and buy a permit. So I think that really facilitated uh, an increase in license sales, you know, early in the day. And uh, so it went really quite smooth. You had to be uh, ready to buy a permit if you wanted to get one because they did sell out pretty quick. So it was a smooth process this year. Um, I will just show on the right graph, it also shows how the spike sales, the spike permit sales in a very similar pattern. Uh, those sold out uh, in, in the afternoon, but uh, just a one day thing. So anyhow, that was uh, much smoother this year and, and worked out quite well. Just to update our, our law enforcement section, uh, you know, this is starting to be the busy time of year for those guys um, with fall hunt starting. So they're gonna be really busy all fall dealing with, the, dealing with things. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a few people blow past our AIS check stations. Uh, and, and a lot of those are probably people with canoes or smaller watercraft that may not think they need to stop, but uh, just as a reminder to everybody, any watercraft needs to stop at these check stations to try to prevent uh, the spread of AIS species in the state. Uh, that's a, it's a huge task. It's, uh, it's a, a big effort that uh, our AIS folks go through to try to keep our waters clean. And, and uh, it's hard to, fully staff the crews and, and staff those with uh, uh, good people and, and have them stay. So that's a challenge that we face statewide and, and that's no different here in the region. Um, just another note, the Flaming Gorge and Green River visitations remain high this year. It seems to be a lot of uh, violations with no life jackets, uh, you know, boating under the influence and things like that as well. So uh, anyhow, that's 
there was a big push during COVID on some of our areas where we had lots and lots of people out, but it looks like uh, that area is still retaining very high use this year by people. Just a reminder to everybody, the trail camera laws went into effect August 1st, basically prohibits anybody from um, using a trail camera in the, in the, the attempt to take big game uh, as well as cougars and bears during, during the fall seasons. So just a reminder of that um, uh, for, for everyone. So it'll be something I, I know our law enforcement will be spending some time on as those uh, issues come up. Um, we're also uh, looking to hire five new officers in, in, in this, throughout the state. Uh, so we've got a hiring pool going on that and try to staff um, a number of statewide vacancies around the state. So uh, a lot of work going on in law enforcement and they're really approaching a really busy season. So, um, so in the wildlife section, uh, uh, kind of some exciting news is uh, we moved uh, some desert bighorn from, from Nevada to the Young Living uh, Skyrider Ranch facility over near Taviona. This was an old elk um, high fenced area that uh, hasn't been used for elk for a few years. And we're able to come up with agreement with uh, Young Living Corporation to use that as a nursery herd for desert bighorn sheep. So four rams and 27 ewes were transplanted into that facility. And the idea is that population grows, we'll be able to use it for a trans transplant source to other areas in the state. It's becoming increasingly hard to find clean, disease-free bighorn herds to transplant from. So the idea is to, to maintain some of those, uh, those clean herds in, in a facility like this to be able to, to utilize in the future. So um, the elk, the, there's been an elk plan revision committee formed uh, at the statewide level that is looking to do some revisions to the, the statewide elk plan. In fact, there's a, a meeting going on this afternoon, this evening with that uh, Daniel Davis or other RAC member was excused tonight because he's on that committee. But the idea is to have some revisions of that uh, that rule uh, come before the, the RAC and board um, in November. So be on the lookout for that. Um, you know, depredation work has picked up with elk living in agriculture areas. We have a number of areas throughout the basin where uh, elk find refuge and and at night come into people's corn and alfalfa fields. We deal with a lot of issues with that. And this is the time of year where that, that picks up often. So uh, our biologists are out doing preseason classification on elk as well as pronghorn um, to come up with help with, with permit recommendations. And another, uh, inform other uh, event that's happened this week uh, was a bat blitz. It was held this week. And it's basically where people from out throughout the state come to a, a particular area for a night and uh, they do a bunch of netting for bats just to uh, come up with a better understanding of what species are out there and, and how they're distributed. And so it was uh, this year was this region was the the, uh, the site for that. I know Natasha participated in that. So if anybody has any questions, they can they can hit her up. Um, outreach has been busy uh, this time of year. There's a lot of wildlife events, some watchable wildlife events going on. Uh, the Osprey Watch up at Flaming Gorge had 93 people uh, come in, in a really hot day to, to watch Osprey. So people continue to show up to that every year in, in large numbers. But uh, one of the most uh, exciting events that that's been going on the last couple of years in the region is the hummingbird banding up at Red Canyon. Uh, there were 210 participants this year. There were 72 uh, hummingbirds that were captured. Uh, many of those were tagged, uh, or I think most of them were tagged, but there were several of them that were, were recaptures from last year. So uh, on the picture, you can see the trap. Um, up at Red Canyon Lodge, they have hummingbird feeders out and they get uh, just a number of hummingbirds uh, using those. And so this trap, it's a little net that uh, falls over the, the feeder and the birds and you're able to catch them quite easily to, to, to ban them. This is really the start um, of migration back south from areas in Canada. And uh, you, you uh, typically will find all four species that you'd expect to find uh, present at this event. So there'll be a uh, monarch butterfly tagging uh, event at Josie's cabin at Dinosaur National Monument on August 13th. And that's gonna be at 8.30 in the morning for, for folks that'd like to come out and, and help on those kinds of uh, activities. Another cool thing that uh, we're doing this year is uh, 
our outreach staff is partnering with the uh, UB Tech, their culinary pro program in Roosevelt, and they're going to do a wild game cooking clinic. Um, that's September 2nd at 5 p.m. Uh, I hear they're making elk tapas, and uh, we serve the audience. But uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about is you know, how to cook game without overcooking it and just some tips uh, and things for that. So I think that'll be a pretty cool event. The culinary program uh, at UB Tech is pretty neat. And so I think it'll be interesting to see what they can do with wild game and, and maybe give some people some good ideas. So. Um, our habitat folks are always really busy uh, maintaining lands, uh, fence control, fence maintenance, weed control, just a number of activities. But one of the big events that's done in the summer was uh, construction of six guzzlers in the Dahl Ridge and uh, East Fork uh, fire burn scars. Those fires did take out a couple of guzzlers, um, but uh, habitat folks decided to, to add a couple as well. So they worked with the Forest Service and uh, to get approval to do that. And so we installed six guzzlers. These were all in pretty rough remote areas. So everything had to be flown in with helicopters uh, to get that work done. And uh, actually some of them were built that day uh, while the helicopter was there, but others uh, folks had to hike back into and, and, and finish the construction on those. So we're excited about that project and um, it'll be really good. And finally, our aquatic section, uh, they're really busy right now as well. Um, one of the things I'll report on is that the water delivery line at the Old Fort Ponds was, was installed and a smaller pond had been leaking and that has been sealed. And so they actually been able to get the water levels back up where they needed to be and uh, were able to stop catfish and other fish species in there this year. So giving people a good opportunity to get out and fish. That's a very popular site, so uh, the community really enjoys that. Uh, this week, the O-Weep rote known treatment is going on. Uh, that's up in the Lake Fork drainage. It's, uh, it's a rote known project to remove non-native trout to restore Colorado River cutthroat. And so this uh, it's ongoing this week. They should be finishing up tomorrow, and then there'll be a few days of uh, detox of the stream below that. Um, just a quick reminder for folks, the Colorado River cutthroat, they are... Uh, a species of concern. Uh, there is a conservation strategy that's been developed for those. And the, really the idea behind uh, these these treatments is to uh, try to restore cutthroat viable populations in some of the former ranges to really try to keep them from being listed uh, by the Endangered Species Act. So these are projects that where the state can show that we can manage cutthroat and, and keep them, uh, keep viable populations going and, and it helps. Uh, keep that management authority with the state. Uh, there'll be a West Fork of Carter Creek uh, wrote on treatment on August 31st, just a one day effort. And uh, we'll be uh, stocking some fish back in, in some of these streams following the treatments. And up at Flaming Gorge, they're going to be starting their hydroacoustics and trawl sampling. It's an annual thing. Uh, they have a, a big boat. They go out at night with a really high tech sonar device that uh, detects uh, targets in the water and then they'll tr pull a trawl behind that to sample what those marks are. And it's targeting kokanee salmon and gives you a good estimate of what uh, the age class looks like, what the recruitment is for, for young kokanee. Typically, you're targeting one-year-old fish um, and the, the, the bigger fish can typically get out, but it really gives you an idea of what your, your population is going to be looking like as those mature in the next three or four years. So anyhow, a lot of work going on. I think that's the, the balance of my update, unless anybody has any questions. A question. <clears throat> Did they find any suspect quagga mussels on, in any of the stations? Um, my understanding is there's a couple that showed up on boats uh, that were, were interdicted and decontaminated. So that is a successful yeah. project then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they were live, but there were mussels attached to a couple of boats, but they were able to uh, catch those and take care of them. Thanks, Miles. Um, we'll move to item number five on the agenda. Chelsea Duke, Wildlife Lands Coordinator. Um, Chelsea, if if you don't mind, just give us 
um, a brief summary. You don't have to go into the details. We saw your video. And by the way, you did a very good job on that, on video. Um, I know it's not easy, but it, it was well done. Well, thank and you. Just give us a, whatever you feel you want to give the, the, the rack here, just a summary. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and um, discuss our proposed changes to the use of division lands rule. Um, like I, like you said, my name is Chelsea Duke, and I'm out of the Salt Lake office. I'm the wildlife lands coordinator. Um, so really what, what our hope here is to update this rule. Um, like I said in the video, it's been about 14 years since this rule has seen any updates and changes. So it was, it was due for a cleanup. Um, mostly we just cleaned up some things that were unclear to both the division and the public. We wanted to make sure that everything was um, in line with our, our current process and procedure and make that as transparent for division employees as well as for the public. Um, we didn't change a whole lot of things about how we operate, just made it cleaner, updated. Um, the, the one big thing that we did change is we added a definition for motorized vehicles, which we did include e-bikes. So that's been a, a topic of conversations around the racks. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. I had one. Um, talk about the, the camping on the on the WMAs, has there been any changes, or is it just a clarification of the rules? Yeah. So um, let me. I'm going to pull up my notes here just to make sure I'm getting everything correct. Um, as far as camping, we didn't make any sweeping changes to uh, camping specifically. So in the updated or the proposed, I should say, the proposed changes, and we're talking about section four, so this is unlawful uses and activities on division lands. Um, we cleaned up a lot of this, so you'll see a lot of red, a lot of red line on this section, but it wasn't because we're removing it, it was because it was duplicated from Utah code. And so since code is higher than rule, we wanted to get rid of that duplication, just in case if there was any changes in Utah code, we wouldn't have to come back and amend this. Those would be covered in Utah code. So you'll see a lot of red, but it, it, we didn't get rid of anything. Um, with camping, there was um, one, and be generous when I call it camping, but we we clarified in the code that we didn't want um, motorized vehicles or trailers or camping um, for more than 10 consecutive days within a 30 day period. So um, this, you know, this was a recommendation from law enforcement where they were seeing some use of properties more for residential purposes than actual camping in the aid of hunt. Um, so we wanted to clarify what our expectations were in there. And then there is nothing um, in the rule that explicitly said that we were gonna prevent camping. I know that there has been a little bit of discussion around that on the different various rack boards, but really this, this rule is, you know, this would have to be a blanket across all properties. And we wanted to ensure that the regions through um, habitat management plans had the flexibility to make those calls on each specific WMA because they're all so different. So there's nothing in the proposed changes that explicitly um, says no camping. Thank you. I'll open up to questions from the REC. Um, I think I'd heard discussion maybe from other racks about the guide and outfitter being in the special use permit, and maybe that was something you did support to add into that area. Is that something that still is supported, that change or suggestion? Yeah, that was okay. um, that was a really great suggestion that, I, honestly, I hadn't thought about when we were looking at these changes. Um, there was a decision that came out of the board uh, in June 2021 that was specific to waterfowl outfitters and guiders that said that that was going to be required to have a special use permit through this, this same process. Um, when we were when we were coming through, um, I hadn't realized that that requirement was not spelled out in the waterfowl rule. So um, upon that recommendation, I, I do still support that, that we, we add that into um, the examples of when a special use permit would be required. It would technically already be covered under um, commercial or, um, or gain of some kind, but I, I do support calling it out fully.
I've, I've got a quick question <laughs> regarding that same issue. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk about, you know, how guides in the Flaming Gorge area have to be going through a um, outfitter. But on the Wasatch, especially on the Pro Provo River, it's just these guys say, I I'm going to guide, and they guide people. Is, is the state aware of that, and is there any enforcement on that? I mean, I'm a guide on the Green River. We have to have CPR. We have to have all these requirements, and I'm not too sure if that goes for the rest of the state. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, you know, we we hadn't r really looked at outfitters and guides um, requiring special use permits until this did come through the board in, in 2021. So um, as of now, I I think looking forward, we're going to have to look at staffing and what that looks like moving forward uh, with issuing special use permits to all guides if that does pass through um, the board and gets approved and and put into this administrative rule. Right now, um, there are some outfitters and, and guides and such that do get special use permits through the division, but it's more our non-traditional users, not our hunting and our fishing guides, but some um, other type of recreational users that, that get special use permits. So um, we're gonna talk about expanding that. The other thing I'd maybe add, um... Where Chelsea's talking about division land specifically, but uh, division doesn't regulate you know guiding and outfitting the division doppel. I forget the actor what what that stands for. It, it's doppel, but I yeah Department of Professional Licensing that regulates it for the state and then the Forest Service as the land management agency. I think has their own set of regulations as well. So um, so with the Provo River, that's uh, I, I guess it's not Forest Service property, so it's probably has a different set of rules and also we're concerned with uh, you know the utah side of the c section of the green river uh there's a lot of colorado people that are guiding it on through the blm that are really making that section of river pretty busy and i was just wondering if there's you know, if the division is aware of that. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, as as Miles said, this rule would only pertain to outfitters and guiders that are doing that on division land. So on a, on a WMA, we do, we have no authority over other guiding that I know of. <laughs> mm -hmm. The biggest say in that simply because it's, it's it's a Utah resource. Is the Browns Park wildlife area? Do they float through that? The state WMA. We we cannot guide through the refuge now, and so uh, we are required to take out at Swallow Canyon. The federal refuge or the state? The federal one? refuge, the person there who was brand new a few years ago said you cannot guide through a federal refuge. But the state refuge above that, does it have river? Yeah, the river end? does run through there, but it's state sovereign land. Uh, the, the actual ownership of the river itself. So the oh, EWR doesn't have possession of the river, uh, just the property that surrounds it. I see. Yes. Yeah, so, so to clarify, unless you were putting in or taking out on the WMA, if they were to put in or take out on different points, they could still float through the river. I don't have any, Tyrell, you didn't have a, did you have a card on this item or was it the next, the next item? Um, I don't have any cards from the public, but are there any questions from the public regarding the land, the WL, WMA land use rules? And Chelsea, I just have a quick clarification and I'm sorry if it's, I'm not understanding it right, but I was, oh, I thought it was good enough. Can you hear me? 
I just had a quick clarification about um, some of the grazing language that was in the rule change. As far as um, some of that decision making authority, is that can is that delegated down to the habitat manager locally? Is that going to be delegated higher? Because it seems like it's really unique for the regions that those issues occur in, and there's a lot of coordination that happens kind of at a local level. Um, and I just was curious about that clarification. And then two, uh, for the trailing, not to exceed two consecutive days. Um, and, it, and it just said it may not be feasible in some areas, just with uh, animal issues, topography, and maybe coordination with local uh, surface managers. Because I know like there's a lot of BLM lands that have similar grazing issues, with similar grazing persons that sometimes hold those permits. So I just wanted those two clarifications. Um, and that's it, thanks. Sure, um, so I will just address that briefly and then because it's so region specific, I'm gonna um, ask Pat if he has any additions, but um, we do, um, within the lands program, we don't regulate grazing at the, the Salt Lake level. We leave that up to the regions because we're, our point of grazing is to, for the benefit of those wildlife areas, um, it's not open bid for every property. It's really specific to each WMA that requires grazing to help wildlife. Um, so that that is in the hands of the region to make those decisions. Um, Pat, do you have anything to add, or that's especially that second point? Come over, come out, come to the mic. <laughs> Mainly, it was just I just wasn't sure, like reading through that rule change, like if that decision making would still be like at the region level, or if it was moving up to a higher it's, level. It's always been at the regional okay. level. My understanding is that it will okay, remain perfect. so. Just, just because we know the, the land, we know the people, we Perfect. know the partnerships, all those, all those things. And, and then the uh, the second one was the the trailing. Is that new? That not to exceed two days. That's always been forty eight hours. Okay. With those uh, exceptions okay. in there, and, and it depends on where you are, the terrain, if it falls on a weekend, you know mm -hmm. what's going on, all those sorts of things. Perfect. So we, okay. we, that's it's been forty eight, but we've left some some wiggle room in there, just knowing that. You might have a poor weather day. Cows can mm -hmm. only move so far in a day. So there's some other issues. To, okay. so. Awesome. All right. Thank you. And, and Chelsea, I just had the last question I had was the class one e-bikes. Was that settled on just because they're similar to the, um, an actual mountain bike or and no e-bikes? is would I mean, was there like some discussion there about the class ones? There was. This was this was a main topic when we were reviewing this rule. Um, so, in the the current rule as it stands, there was no definitions of a motorized vehicle. So we we talk about it a lot in the rule, and then we don't call out what it what do we classify as a motorized vehicle. Um, the e bikes came up during the waterfowl um, rule revision. And so we, we had a lot of discussion about on waterfowl management areas, what does that look like using e-bikes? Um, and so one of our main points was to make sure that we're staying in line with that decision that came through the board, which was to include class two and three e-bikes in motorized vehicles and to restrict them to existing roads or, or trails. Um, and so we didn't want to contradict a rule that had just been put forward. So that was um, a main topic. And then, you know, through our research of well, what is a class one versus two and three, um, we looked at, um, you know, habitat damage and, and what these e-bikes are, are capable of. And we felt that class one was a little bit more similar to a mountain bike because you have to be pedaling for the assist to come into play. And so then if we ban class one, are we going to ban mountain bikes? And if we're going to ban mountain bikes, you know, it's, it kind of can be a, a slippery slope. So that was, um, our, our decision-making process, um, if, if you can say that, for um, excluding class ones. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any more comments from the RAC? If not, I'll ask Miles whether there was any um, public comment submitted through the online. Yeah, nobody uh, made a specific comment on this topic. There's three people that that cast a vote, I guess, and and all three of them need were neutral. They didn't agree or disagree. So that was it. 
Um, no, everyone's good. The public, no comments. Um, I see Joe has has joined our meeting. Joe, would you take a moment to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, uh, Joe Arnold, representing the public. Sorry for my late attendance. No problem. Thanks, Joe. Um, should be ready to vote on this issue. Okay. Um, I guess that's all the discussion. You have a challenging job all the way from the Great Salt Lake to the high country, trying to make a rule that fits it all. Virtually impossible. So uh, I would take a motion from the rack if we're ready. I'll make a motion to accept the proposal as presented with the addition of adding the outfits and guiders to the special use examples. I second it. Special use. Okay. Did we have a second on that? Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second to appro approve the the item as presented with the addition to look into special use permits or just add the um, guide and outfitter wording to the special use um, permit examples. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Robert, are you ready to vote? How about Joe? Yes. Robert, maybe he's having some mute issues with his phone. Um, we'll get we'll get that vote from Robert, but uh, motion passes either seven, either unanimous seven zero or or six one, whichever Thank you, way that works out. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you. We'll move on to the proposed fee schedule and Kenny has, he loves to come to Vernal yes, I and, do. and he's here. Uh, I actually do really well. You, you did a good job on your video too, Kenny. Don't let me <laughs> make you second place, but you're kind of like Jay Leno, you know, so. With his face made you're, for you're, radio. Co you're comfortable up there. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Kenny, and uh, give us a brief summary. Okay, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, Kenny Johnson, the admin services chief uh, based in Salt Lake City. And I do love getting out to all the regions again. It, uh, it's good to get out of the valley and, and see some of our beautiful state. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to mention before we get too deep into the discussion. Uh, one of the things uh, that I, I failed to mention in my presentation was that we had recently taken a fairly significant non-resident fee increase through the legislature. Uh, it happened in 2020. And I don't think that was as common knowledge as I as I thought it was at the time. And so um, some of the comments early were that we weren't hitting them hard enough or, or raising non-resident rates enough. And so I wanted to just make sure that we we balance that discussion. We we did have a fairly significant increase with non-residents a couple short years ago. Um, and so I wanted to clarify that and then just kind of give an overview of where we where we started with the fee process. It's a, it's a long list, it's a, it's a big schedule. Uh, we haven't come to the, to the Raxon board for a resident increase and in, it'll be almost 10 years by the time, you know, this would, would go through. And so we've been really fortunate that way. We, we feel like our fee structure and our schedule is really proven. And so we just wanted to take that successful base and then start at about a 10% increase and then just look at things kind of, um, to right size different, you know, different species maybe or opportunities with, within the state. And so you'll see like the, the big birds, we, one of the examples is to standardize the, the opportunity of, of harvesting a bigger bird um, swan or a, a crane to, to the same rate as turkey and, and things like that. And so we wanted to modernize it. It's been a long time since we looked at everything. And um, so we wanted to modernize it and then, and then just bring that approach out through the, through the racks. So that's, that's kind of what I would add to my to my presentation. And as far as the the rack, um, 
Is everything on there fair game or some of the things legislative and some decisions by the by the division? I mean, fee by fee, we, we can definitely listen to to all the ideas, right? I think I think that's fair to fair to say. I would just say that overall, um, where it gets where it gets trickier is is tackling fees that maybe stem from um, either a management decision or or you know kind of more of a process decision and and, and structure based. So I think fees are fees are fine. That's kind of what I'm here to propose that we do is just change it like we like we proposed. Anything structural or, or programmatical, it, I, I would say um, it would be better to, to kind of give them their own due diligence and, and take a little longer with those. But um, yeah, it's, it's fair game for sure. Okay, with that, I'll open it up to questions from the rack. I will ask one. Um, there was quite a bit of a comment on the on the crane and swan and turkey, making them kind of standard. What, did you hear much from the public or around the state about maybe the fact that a turkey and a swan and a crane costs about this, almost as much as an elk tag? A little bit, yeah. So, and we looked at it as just a limited a limited entry opportunity. And and that was the impetus to just standardize those across the board at, at the forty the forty dollar rate. So you don't let me put words in your mouth, but you you kind of looked at more uh, permit versus permit equity type thing as opposed to how them changes affected revenue. That yeah, that's a that's an okay way to put it. I think uh, I think the the probably the driver there was more that opportunity. Yeah, those don't, they don't generate a lot even with the, the new changes because the, the numbers are really limited, which kind of helped that decision be more of a standard set rate at, at the 40, at the $40, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, um, go to the public. Questions? Questions. Okay. Um, we've got a few comment cards. Uh, we'll from the public. We'll start with Bruce. Do you have any questions first? Then we're ready. Uh, I guess so. All right. Do we have questions? Any clarification? Tyrell, you have a question? Um, please use a mic, right? Use that one right there. Tyrell A. Begman, dedicated hunter. Um, on the topic of doubling the, de the dedicated hun hunter hours to $40 an hour, I got to say, I'm pretty flattered that the DNR thinks my time's worth $40 an hour. First question would be, can anybody call my employer and let him know? Um, secondly, I mean, and, and I, I watched a few of the other racks, and I mean, I know a lot of the other regions, they don't have much trouble getting projects. And if I remember right, there was like 10 or 15% of the hours statewide is all that's really bought. And I bet most of those because they have to. And I mean, um, the, I, I've been doing this for 10 years. And when I first started, it was pretty hard to find projects. Tanya's really been busting her ass trying to get projects going around, and it really helped out. Then when the pandemic hit, you couldn't get any groups, couldn't get any projects. And on years like that, you're, you're talking $850 for two deer, as it is. With this proposal, you're almost $1,500. That's more than any of our uh, once-in-a-lifetime permits. So what's the chances of, if this goes through to maybe give us a tag every year, let us kill three deer in the three years? So I, I guess from a question standpoint, can you go ahead and address the whether you've had a bunch of discussion about that? Those are all great points. It's one of those that the, the, the inner workings of the Dedicated Hunter Program, kind of more the structure of it, it's one of those we ought to we ought to take some time with. The purpose of of increasing the fee as high as we did was to return it to its original intent, which was to do projects on the ground and have have people find something meaningful early on in the process and and do it. And we and we know that it was rough during the the pandemic on some of that. And and internally, you know, talking to the to the managers, I think I think we're up to the task of finding good 
good solid projects and and hopefully we can just meet that demand so the intent's almost to make it a deterrent to buy your hours and and to get out and do the projects yeah okay is there any other questions from the public Okay, sorry, forgive me if I stutter. Um, Allison Bywater, I'm also a dedicated hunter. Um, <clears throat> this project, the dedicated hunter project was started to help encourage the next generation of hunters to want to be able to enjoy our public lands. And the lack of projects and the increase in fees is really going to hurt the generation's and the people that actually are designed for this project. Most of the people that do the dedicated hunter program were not in the five percentile of income. We have to work hard. We go do, I mean, I have, I'm also on my 10th year of the project and we have done the Jarvie Fest. We have done the Salmon Run and I have watched and loved so many little kids actually enjoy fishing enjoy getting out into the outdoors. But the people that actually buy their hours, they're only going to just see it as a money and just so that they can kill those two deer a year in that three year project. And that's really going to hurt the people that this was designed for when this project was launched over a decade ago. And Almost $1,500 per deer is almost ridiculous. And we will be paid more than the biologists because I've spoken to many biologists and employees of the DNR and they have requested to use dedicated hunters for planting fish or other things that they were shorthanded on and they were denied that request. And upping those hours is just going to encourage a lack of interest in the program because I know that I will not be able to continue if, those hour, if, if the fee is increased. So I encourage the RAC to please not increase the fees because this is already a struggle for all of us. I know everyone is struggling right now, and this is just going to make it harder for a program that was supposed to encourage the next generation. Thank you. Um, so maybe address that, Kenny, if you can. I, I know we're talking project specific stuff, but yeah, I, um, I definitely appreciate all the input. We we get it. We totally understand it. I think the maybe one of the things misunderstood is the, you know, a handful of years ago, we, we took the limit off of what hours you could purchase. And we saw that jump significantly. It's probably closer to half of the hours being bought now. And so we wanted to de kind of de deter that a little bit and say, no, let's let's get back to what this was intended for. And so it's kind of a disincentive to to just come in you know very last minute right before the archery hunt and and drop your money and and get your tag we we want people to look early on and and you know work with our good coordinators on the ground and, and figure out a project that's meaningful and and do all the things that that we're hearing about it i think that's that's definitely part of the the intent with the increase not to not to generate a ton more money we we hope this is enough that it'll say hey i better i better get on the ball early and and go go work on a, on a project with the division. So. And the, the number, I'll let you comment in just a moment. Um, the, the dollar figures that you were throwing out is if you bought all your points. Yeah. Okay. Just so just to clarify that big number that was thrown out. Um, any more questions? Is there a question or a comment? Because we're still going to go into comments. Um, I just, I was wondering, um, 
Can I can I hand it over you there? It's, 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 it's oh, oh, I was going to say I yeah. can put up. Yeah, you can sit if you want to. Um, what about um, allowing more of the dedicated hunters to help biologists and the employees of the DNR? Will that be more of an option? Because as of right now, they are being denied the use of dedicated hunters. Will that be addressed? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's a good question. And I, th I think, uh, and, and maybe Tanya can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's one of the intents all the way along is to, to involve the public where we can and in, in everything we can on the ground. And so I, I, you know, not being over that program, I can't make that promise, but I think that's always been the intent is to have as many volunteers come and do that work and, and kind of shoulder to shoulder with us as, as we can. So I, I think we can commit to that. Hi, Tanya Kiefer Selby, uh, outreach manager. Um, so we are hoping not to deny any dedicated hunters to assist. There was a denial in some respects where we had uh, dedicated hunters helping with certain aquatics projects, but that was discussed and that no longer is an issue. Hence why we're allowing some creel survey, dedicated hunter hours, et cetera. So as of right now, we don't have anything that we're gonna be denying that I'm aware of. So we should be okay. Yeah, please come on, come on up, Bruce. Come on back, Jenny. I'll go to the mic. <laughs> it's an awkward spot. Hi, I'm Bruce Thomas from uh, Duchesne. Um, I'm not very good at public speaking, but sitting back there, it's all come down to money is what I've been getting. It's all about the dollar. You know, what happened to getting back to the basics and taking care of the animals, taking care of the property? That's what the BLM Forest Service, their managers, the DWR, are supposed to take care of the wildlife, right? So why don't we get back to the basics? They quit making dang on laws and rules and regulations. You need a dang on attorney to go with you to understand everything. Let's simplify it. Let's get back to the basics. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about, if I can, is the cost of resident limited entry elk permits. $526 for a resident? Non-resident? Resident. Oh, li limited entry. Come on, let's get that back down to where the common people can take and hunt too. You figure it out, do the math. If you take and lower your price and get more tags bought, that's more, more revenue, right? Isn't it? Now you got it up to $526 and only the ones that are working and stuff, I'm not working. I am retired medically. I don't make that much money. Can I, can I clarify one thing? Yeah, go ahead. I, I appreciate that, Bruce. One of the, just to clarify, that's that's the multi-season version of the, the limited entry. Just the single season. That was single season. Single season only jumped 10%. It went to like 314. That's still too high. So Get it down to 160 bucks, I'll pay that. And then another thing you need to take and have more tags after the draw, 17,000 tags for 3 million people. Let's get real. You got to get more tags out there. You can't take and, um, I live to hunt. I did. And then I got sick and I can't do that much anymore. But I love to hunt. I love to go out there. I don't have, I only get paid once a month. And there's a lot of other people that only get paid once a month too because they're on social security disability. Why can't we get a, a chance to buy the tags? You know what I'm saying? Let's make it a little bit fair. I was told I had to do it all online. And then they said, no, you could go down and do it a, uh, across the counter. Let's get things clarified and make it simpler. I know there's a lot more people out there hunting or wanting to hunt. And there's other people out there that want to stop you from hunting. Okay. Then another thing. Um, you make all these new hunts every year. You know, you got the youth hunt for this and the youth hunt for that, and that all becomes before the regular season. Let's stop it. Growing up, 
We did everything together, family. And that's what Utah is about, is family. If you uh, understand the LDS religion and stuff, it's all about family. Okay, I'm not LDS. But a kid will get more out of it if he's out there with the family and dad or mom shows him how to hunt versus an early hunt. Well, the, the whole idea is to come back and say, well, they have a better chance of getting some. That's something that you got to take a chance on. You can't take and uh, guarantee somebody. I ran the U-Bar up Uena Canyon for two years. I did guiding and outfitting. I did outfitting in Idaho. I did guiding and outfitting in Montana. And I'll tell you what, I've never seen something so screwed up as Utah is right now. They are. I have three great uncles that were fish and game officers for Utah. They're all deceased. And I'll tell you what, they're rolling in their grave right now to see what's going on in this state. Oh, I, I appreciate your comments, and I, I know the RAC does. Um, and, and I'm not trying to argue with you, but we do the permit numbers at a different, we're talking about the fees now, and you did make some comments directed at fees. And we would appreciate it if you, you know, when the permit recommendations come out, that you um, come back and also address that. Uh, I will tell you that most of what we hear is don't give more permits. You know, the opposite of what you're saying, um, Tyrell and some of the regular attendees. And I'm not trying to pick, you know, pick sides or something. I'm just saying your voice would be would be really relevant in that meeting because we don't hear the give more tags. We hear they're not big enough and we want to cut tags all the time so why don't you cut the hunts well my point is the you know there's hunt structures and there's numbers but um just so you know i, I mean to, tonight we're talking about the fees and you did make some comments right. directed at the fees your other comments though your point is well taken is not on the agenda tonight it's a different night when we do the permit numbers which is in I'll come back over, April. just let me know. Is it, it's a spring one, because we do okay. the winter counts and see what the winter survival is, and then it's in April. And do, does the DWR still count the deer for every one they see? They count 10? <laughs> I don't know. That's you can, you, can, you, can ask, you can ask that question at that meeting, you know, how they come okay. up with the numbers, but there will be populations and permit recommendations at that meeting. So I would... You know, let's just get the cost down. Let's get it down okay. to what normal. And that's relevant can. for this meeting. So, yeah, and let's we appreciate the cost down. Appreciate your comments. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Tanner Carlson. Tanner Carlson representing SFW tonight. Just want to thank you guys uh, for taking your time and meeting here tonight. Um, we appreciate uh, the division not raising uh, fee prices on veterans and youth. Um, that's that's a huge thing. We appreciate that. We get to work with the division close on projects and everything's going up. Just the other day at Maverick, I saw uh, husband and wife spend $80 on snacks. Things are just getting expensive and so SFW does support the fee increases. Um, we get that it's just the cost of doing business. Things are going up, projects are getting more expensive. Um, these tags do fund a lot of that. And so we're in support. Thank you guys. Tyrell, hey, Bigman again. Um, here a few years ago after things, Four years after the dedicated hunter program started with deer, they uh, come to the rack meetings and they proposed doing it for, for elk. But the problem was is they were worried about having enough projects. And right now in the middle of the summer, even with no pandemic going on, there's only two projects in this region that do not require either donations or special skills. In the middle of the summer, we've only got two. And that's been my worry this whole time. I and mean, yet you... I've been lucky enough in the 10 years that I've did this, I've only had to buy my hours once. And doubling this, I mean, there's one other rack that 
just uh, voted to just do 25 or $30, but 40 oh, my hell, guys. Rachel, did you want to come anymore? You're good. Any additional comments or questions from the rack? We have one one other letter that we were asked to read. Uh, you want me to read it? You want? To? I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll ask Miles to read that. It's from the Mule Deer Foundation. All right. Uh, the letter says uh, increased fees to to participation are never popular, but the cost of essential operations has risen substantially for Utah DWR since the last residential fee increase in 2014. State and fish state fish and wildlife agencies typically receive about 75 percent of their funding from the federal aid to wildlife restoration fund and required to match the remaining 25 percent of costs with funding often derived from revenues from the sale of hunting and hunting licenses permits and stamps the cost of fulfilling the operations of the agency have and will continue to increase thus hampering the dwr's efforts to manage wildlife resources in Utah. MDF believes that the services provided by the DWR are readily recognized and appreciated by engaged and knowledgeable sportsmen and women who recreate in the state. The increased fee to participate in Utah's vast outdoor recreation opportunities are quite reasonable when the increase amounts to less than a bucket of popcorn at the theater, a box, uh, the cost of a box of ammunition or even the tank of gas consumed en route to our favorite hunting grounds. The Mule Deer Foundation supports the increase as needed, as a needed adjustment and applauds Utah Division of Wildlife for demanding public service work provided. This modest fee increase will in ensure the ongoing mission of the Utah DWR and help with meeting the challenges of the future. Thank you. Um, Kenny, that leads into a, maybe a, something I'll ask you to address. Um, we've seen it at the RAC orientations, but I'm not sure the public has seen it. Would you just give a general breakdown of where the funding, how the DWR is funded in approximate percentages? Yeah, so so kind of rough overview. It's It's probably just a little over half comes from hunting and fishing licenses. And then we do get a, a fairly substantial chunk from the from the federal excise tax match on on the backside of that. And then about two percent of it um, overall is from I mean eight percent, sorry, about eight percent of it overall is is just general tax dollars. So we are primarily self-funded um, and try to operate you know the, the best we can within our within our means all the time and that's kind of just a, a big over overarching approximately budget. 92 percent self self-funded self -funded. correct yeah how did the online com comments come in on this miles so uh with fee increases there were eight people that responded um and so 12 and a half percent strongly agreed at uh, 12 and a half percent somewhat agreed uh 12 and a half percent somewhat disagreed and uh 62 and a half percent strongly disagreed um so just kind of the general themes of those online comments there were a couple of people that just in general uh, disagreed with uh, fee increases um i think uh kind of those themes is you know the cost of living for everybody is pretty high right now and, and uh, they just were frustrated about another fee increase uh, to their daily lives um, we had a couple other people that commented that they felt like the increase of the dedicated hunter uh, buyout fee was too much at forty dollars and so uh, one of the specific comments is they felt like existing permit existing uh, dedicated hunters in the system should be grandfathered through with the current fee structure if, if it were passed. Um, another person uh, supported raising the, the dedicated overall dedicated hunter fee to $300 a year and he they only wanted to see the dedicated hunter be able to produce one harvest one buck in three years so it was, it was a little different. Um, another uh, theme was that uh, public didn't support 
limited entry and once in a lifetime permit increases. I uh, felt like those were high enough as they are. And uh, then lastly, there was a comment about uh, swan and uh, crane tags being too high at, at $40. So uh, the online comments, I think, were pretty similar to what we've heard here in person tonight. Thank you. Um, I guess, uh, just one second. Um, what I heard, I'm not very familiar with the buy-in of ours, so I'm getting educated a little bit as we go. Um, there's a group that maybe doesn't go out and actively get their work done, and then last minute they buy their hours, and then there's a group that can't find a project but wants to work, right? And you're trying to find a way to disincentive to make it not an incentive to put it off right but these other individuals that you know maybe don't have a project available or the what you mentioned special skills or whether it's welding or whatever they're requiring um okay um so, so i'm kind of hearing that there's probably two groups of these dedicated hunters those that that either just rather buy their hours or put off doing the work and then those that are actively trying to keep their costs at a minimum. Is that an accurate assessment? And, and, and getting into the project the way it was designed and the, why it was launched is so that we can be a part of the public and show that there is interest in hunting and show the next generation that, hey, this is why we're here. Instead of just throwing money at it like, I mean, I know that's the way most of the world works. But. Oh, sorry. Oh. sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get some work done with these dedicated hunters. And so if they if they just buy them, it doesn't do anybody any good. Well, that, uh, that's definitely the intent. And I think what happened over time is it just got too easy and convenient to just pay for those hours and call that your, your you know, way to go hunt. And we definitely do want to get back to where we're, we're in the trenches together with boots on the ground doing doing good projects for wildlife and that that was always the intent so yeah that was the we worry if we don't increase it enough it'll still be convenient and easy maybe to just come pay your your fee and this this we hope stirs up the the conversations and gets people looking for for projects and then and then quite honestly puts the puts the onus on us to to find those and make sure we can fulfill those those requests so it's pretty hard to D define who's in what group oh, my you know when you have a list of names um, is there a way to put it back where they can only buy out a certain amount of their hours so then it it's still encouraging them to do the projects but um maybe not raising the fee so much i don't know you know, that's definitely um, something we could probably talk about again in that structure side of things. That's a whole different set of rules and all all that stuff. So, you know, for, for tonight's discussion, it's just the sweet spot maybe on fees, but definitely a, a good thought moving forward. That's a good a suggestion where you can only buy a certain percentage and it re would require a work, an hour component from everybody to participate. Mr. Uh, Mr. Thomas, do, do, oh, all right, we'll go to Jeff and then Mr. Thomas. Uh, I belong to a nonprofit in Trout Unlimited and Trout Unlimited does projects with the DNR. I'm wondering if uh, the other sportsman group, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, Mule Deer Foundation, Pheasants Forever, blah, 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 how much do those nonprofits cut into um, dedicated hunter work? So I would say those are all super valuable partners with the with the division. I don't know that they're taking away these opportunities. I think I think it enhances it and and provides a little bit more. But I'll let I'll let Tanya talk. 
the nice thing about working with those NGOs is that we do have the opportunity to partner with them. So depending on if it's a wildlife related project, we do host several projects where we will partner with RMEF or MDF or Pheasants Forever, whatever, um, Wildlife Conservation Foundation, and we'll partner with them just to do projects that dedicated hunters can complete their hours because we're doing something that benefits wildlife. So they aren't taking away our volunteers for volunteer hours or our volunteer projects. The nice thing is we can actually partner with them to do those projects. And so it just takes the NGO approaching us and asking, you know, to get the project pre-approved and then working to um, recruit any of the dedicated hunters that would be interested in those projects. But in the past, we've done guzzlers. Um, they help out with the youth pheasant hunt. Uh, they've helped with river cleanups. You know, there's been a lot of different things that uh, we've been able to perform with the NGOs with dedicated hunter service. So... I have a comment. Um, as a volunteer myself, I understand and I know what the ownership of participating is. And when you complete a project as a dedicated hunter or a member of Trout Unlimited or whatever, there's a sense of pride there that, that we did this. And I think that's the one of the elements that is missing in this conversation. I think that's truly monumental and truly important to those people who do dedicate the time and the effort that they build this, that, that they are putting something back. There are so many takers out there who want to complain about everything, but they don't want to put anything back into the wildlife system. And so I guess I understand that completely and I support what you guys are doing in that fact. And I want to support the idea that we get more projects for the dedicated hunters. We'll take a, a comment from Mr. Thomas and then we will. We'll give you the mic here. A few years ago, uh, they had 94,000 elk tags put out. And my question is, is how did they come down to 17,500? What's, what was the process of, of dropping the number of tags versus the 94,000 tags statewide? Thanks, sir. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we've been at, we've been at the, the 15 to 17,000 on elk for quite a while. It's been a lot of years, as far back as I can rustily remember. It's the deer tax. They start at 97,000. They chip away at those, cutting them over the last seven years. Yeah, thanks, Tori. So just to clarify, and, it's and deer. Kenny gets to, as, as we change numbers, and on deer, it was drastic changes because of the, the declining deer herds. He's the lucky guy that gets to balance the dollars at the end and say, where am I? You know, how am I going to buy gas for the game wardens or whatever it is? And so he's dealing with the financial end, and we need to we need to understand that. Um, but again, that question is a very, very good question in that meeting when we do permit numbers. Joe, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Brett. Um, yeah, Joe Arnold. The, the one thing, just listening to dedicated hunter, uh, and I think there's, you know, challenges. I, I understand both sides, but I think it sounds like that we're undervaluing people that, that are willing to pay for the materials. I, I don't know if um, some of this, either sometimes people have the time, some pe sometimes people have the money, but it sounds like the only way that we feel like the dedicated hunter program could work is if people are actually doing the projects and it, you know if there's a shortage of labor i guess then you know we probably should make more people participate but i, I don't think those materials are free unless they're all donated I, you know i don't know exactly how that works and so for me i think the value also of somebody buying that out is is helping buy the materials uh, you know so I think there's been, a, you know, a little bit of undervalue there on on buying that out. I mean, just like the guy said uh, from the SFW, 
eighty dollars. Look around. Opex expenses, all operating expenses, are drastically higher. I, I don't know how that we can't raise fees with, in light of, of where everything's going right now with you know with inflation. So I think the biggest thing is the division has a challenge because if people pay more money, they want a quality, quality, you know, um, product. And so, you know, if, if that's probably, you know, in, in each person's eyes and perspective of what is a quality product. And so, um, that, that's just my thoughts on, on the, uh, I think you should be able to buy out. I like Natasha's idea on, on maybe only a certain amount of it. Cause I, I don't know. It sounds like we're, if we're underfunded, because overall the project has to be done and there's then there's a sh certain you know expense that has to go in that whether that be labor or materials and so I, I think that if somebody wants to buy out their hours I, I think that's okay too that's my opinion maybe not very popular but that's my opinion thanks joe any other comments rebecca i just how do the fees in utah compare to other states you know, it, it's it's hard to compare to other states apples to apples just because everybody has a different mix of needs on the ground and, and mix of residents and non-residents and, and structures and all of that. But overall, I, I feel like within the, the last few years, um, bumping non-resident fees a little bit and then trying to right size categorically this time around, I feel like we're, we're really competitive. We're right there. I think uh, still maybe on the light side. But we need to leave some gas in the tank. Honestly, we, you know, we're we're trying to we're trying to raise enough revenue to to push us through the next four, five, six years, depending on what the markets do, and and that's kind of what that's kind of what this is uh, designed to do and, and outlined to do. Could I ask a question again, Brett, Joe? Yes, go ahead. On the fees for non-residents, I, I know, you know, I put in for other states like Colorado will not let you put in for a big game hunt unless you buy some type of a small game. Is there anything like that within our program and our fees? Yeah. Was this Joe again? It is. Yes. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate the question. We do. Utah, one of our strategies is to, to uh, require a hunting license before you can apply. So that's for, for residents and non and, and, uh, and we, we do like that structure. So appreciate that point. What What is that fee for a non-resident, if you don't mind me asking? It's a it's a few. Let me look at it really quick. My my computer, I hope it didn't die. It, uh, it went to sleep. <laughs> I, I know just to answer the question that was asked, uh, if, if as a non-resident, I put in for the state of Colorado for a deer hunt. I have to buy a, a non-resident small game permit. I'd rather buy a fishing permit, but that's not an allowable license. But it's about $112, $115 just to apply for my license to hunt deer in Colorado. And I never usually hunt small game there, but I do have to purchase that license. Okay, I was just looking at a couple of things here, Joe. So combination um, for a non-resident, they can they that one qualifies for an application. So they can buy the the fishing and hunting combo. Now let me just make sure I've got the right line. That one currently is ninety eight. We're proposing that uh, be one twenty five, and then the pure just the plain hunting is seventy two currently. And let's see. Make sure I got the right one. And we are proposing that go to 79. So 79. And when we when we did our, our last round of, of increases for non-residents, we bumped the app fee five bucks. So it's 15 uh, per application. Thank you. One last question. When would the fees go into place? And would you expect to see a whole bunch of people buying like the five-year license, you know, at if this didn't go into effect until January uh, for, you know, the $150, $160 for the combination for five years? Yeah, so the way that works, we we bring it through the racks and the board first, then we send it to the legislature and the governor's office in kind of that December, January timeframe. 
it goes through the, the legislative session. And then typically uh, the next the next fiscal year is when is when fees would kick in. So we'd be looking at like July a year from now. So people could go and purchase those at today's fees over roughly the next year, 11 they, months. They could, and we anticipated a little bit of that in our in our math. Um, but yeah, they abs they absolutely could do that. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll move this forward a little bit. It's important to remember we are talking about fees and there's been some very good points and Miles has been taking notes, you know, about the dedicated hunter and and I guess I guess where or Kenny's the division is recommending a dollar per per hour on the dedicated hunter, we could make a motion that said not to exceed 50% of their hours, or that would still be in this discussion, right? Um, or would you? That one's probably still more structural, but I think you could you can make the, the motion and we can we can chew on it over. Okay, over so it, sure. I'm not saying that, that the rec wants to do that, but if they did, you know, we can get it in on record with a motion. Um, is everyone heard, heard a lot of discussion about the dedicated hunter, um, some discussion about the other fees, non-resident, it was already pretty much addressed two years ago, substantially. I mean, we almost doubled them, some yeah. of them. Yep. And so that, that's been kind of addressed. Um, are we at a point where someone's comfortable making a motion? I just have one more question. So there's a discount for youth and veterans. Is there like a senior citizens discount? There is a 65 oh. and over discount. And we we kept that discount in place. We, the, the Their fee is increasing a little bit, but we kept it discounted from a, a regular. Okay. License, okay. Thank you. And what were the categories on that, Kenny? Uh, on the seniors? It was seniors and youth. And veterans. And so veterans. Seniors is increasing a little bit in our proposal. Youth and veterans, we kept we kept right at the same rate, and that is across the board: fishing, hunting, combo, um, and then deer and elk for youth. Um, and then and then disabled veterans, it's just on their hunting and fishing and combos. Thank you. Okay, I will open it up for a motion. Okay, I'm not sure how we want to do this, but maybe we should pull out the dedicated hunter piece and kind of. I'd, I'd be willing to do that if do we want to make a motion on, uh, regarding the dedicated hunters yeah, and, then, and the rest of the packet. I agree with the rest of the packet. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure here. I need to think about it, but. I don't know if we want, do we want to accept, accept the $40 and then put in that only they can buy out potentially only 50% of their hours or do we want to lower that amount? What is it currently? It's 20 right now. 20? Yes. If that... If if it's not forty dollars, do you have to make up that amount of money in other areas? Or no, our 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 worry is that twenty five or you know thirty maybe doesn't incentivize them to come and find a project. It just it's gotten so easy and convenient for for many of them to just buy hours that we we think that that forty is is the the impetus to to get them to to do projects really. So. So yeah, maybe agreed. we could say we could lower it to maybe $30 an hour if they can only buy out 50% of their hours. Otherwise, it stays at, goes to 40 or something like that. I mean, if whatever the, I don't know. Yeah. If they make half of their hours, it's $30. The first half of their hours at this rate. And then the, the and then the additional you know if they didn't work off half their hours the the last half was at the higher rate to try to target that group absolutely 
Is that something that's, yeah, okay. That's what, actually, I, that's what that's, I proposed for the I dedicated hotel. I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> Do I have to say that yeah. again? <laughs> I knew if we talk long enough, Natasha, I was like up late at idea. night doing bats, okay. <laughs> uh, so restate that um, how you'd like it. Okay, so how do I want to word that? <laughs> you worded it well for me. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess. I, what I heard was 30, 30 on the fee. Yeah. And then with the caveat that we look at trying to find a way to do, uh, to, to, to reduce the amount you can just buy over the counter. Is that? Is yeah, that, we could do that. Or. Okay. Yeah. So like so, it's, a, it, I mean, it could go either way. Yeah. Either like that tiered or yeah. If, if we accept it at a lower price, then that means you can only buy out a certain amount of your hours too. It could go that way as well. How many are hours are we talking? Uh, 32. 32. Yep. 32. Okay. Yep. So state when you make your motion, state the hours also. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Let's see. What do we want? <laughs> yeah, the first yeah, 16. 16 hours could be bought out at $30 an hour. And the rest, if they bought out the rest of the hours, it'd be $40 an hour. I would like to amend that and add that the division tried to find more projects to satisfy the dedicated hunters in each region. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Okay, what I heard was we have a motion to set the fee at $30 an hour for the first 16 hours of dedicated hunter hours, $40 an hour for the, the next 16 for a total of 32 with a, with a direction to the division to to do the best they can to to work with other agency or other groups or whatever it takes to not have a, a deficiency of projects for individuals to work on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Exactly. I was just repeating what you said. I thought that's what yes. you said. <laughs> do, do we have a second? I'll I second will second that. it. There you, you can second it. The motion was from Natasha. The second was from Rebecca. All in favor? Joe? Yes. Robert? No. Okay. Thank you. Motion passes 6 1. And then I'd like to make a motion to pass the rest of the proposal as presented by the division. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a motion from Tasha to, to approve the remainder of the fee increase packet as presented, excluding the dedicated 100 portion. And a seconded by Jeff. All in favor? Joe? Yes. Robert? No. Okay, motion passes 6 1. Um, that is the, uh, thank you, Kenny. Thank you. That is the end of our formal agenda. And then we have some board business to, or some RAC business to do on elections. Sir, anything else, Miles? Okay, thank you, um, general public, for coming. I think it always adds a lot to our discussion and we learn stuff. Could I ask one question going back to the beginning, and it'll be short, I promise, uh, but will this region get one of those law enforcement officers? No, Jeff. We're full with officers here. Sorry, I hit the rollers. Is the meeting adjourned, and this is an extra meeting, the meeting is still being straight? Yeah, the, the meeting is not adjourned yet until this has to be part of official business. Um, I can leave it up to the rack, really how you'd like to do this. We, you know, currently we don't have a vice chair. Uh, we didn't, uh, 
end up voting on that uh, last meeting. Uh, and so we need to uh, take care of that tonight. We had two nominees for vice chair. One was Natasha Haddon. The other was Daniel Davis. And so um, I do have some sticky notes. If the rack, if the rack would like to do that, I could pass out and uh, tally the votes. Um, or if you guys want to do it another way, I'll, I'll leave that up to the, to the rack. I think we'd be better off doing it um, where you count the ballots some, some form. And then um, Joe and Robert, um, were you comfortable, if you want to vote, are you comfortable texting or emailing Miles? Yes. Yeah. Joe can see the chat. That's his vote, I guess. And I don't know if you want to do those guys. Joe and uh, no. Robert, do you ha do you have my number to, to where you can text me your your vote? I, I know Robert does. Yeah, I just text you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Robert, that hasn't come through just yet. Uh, it's still sending. Okay. Who else is missing? Um, Brad.
All right, in a really close, separated by one vote, um, Daniel Davis uh, be the vice chair. Okay, I believe that was our final order of business. I will open it up to a motion to adjourn. I second that. Okay, thank you for attending everyone. Have a good evening.